Welcome back, everyone. Today we have with us Dr. Yvette Sendes. Yvette is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard and Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, where she studies radio signals from some of the biggest explosions in the universe. Yvette is an up and coming radio astronomer. She received her PhD in astronomy from the University of Leiden in Leiden, Netherlands in May 2020, after earning both her four year and master's degree in physics from Case Western Reserve University. Yvette is also a freelance science writer, and she's published several articles for magazines, including Scientific American, Astronomy, and Discover. Yvette is also popularly known on social media, particularly Reddit, where she uh, is very active. She shares her enthusiasm for her work and science-related outreach on a subreddit page called Andromeda321. Thank you for being with us today, Yvette. Sure thing. But let's launch this off by asking, what are your current research interests? Sure thing. So I'm mainly interested in radio transients. So things in the sky at radio frequencies that turn on and off instead of being constantly there. And this can cover a huge range of sources going from exoplanets that are not even that far from Earth to supernovae or tidal destruction events where a black hole shreds a star billions of light years away from us. Whoa. Can you maybe explain as simply as possible what currently are you focused on right now? I've published uh, papers this year on a tidal disruption event that was 3.7 billion light years away and another tidal disruption event that was a little closer. And um, my last paper that I just submitted to the journal last week was about exoplanets and looking for radio signals from them. Um, which could be caused by natural effects like um, the magnetic field surrounding the exoplanet could give off flares, not like looking for aliens uh, exoplanet emission. And the closest one of those is about 35 light years from us. So it's really quite the distance scale. It's all roughly the same idea. You take a big radio telescope like the VLA and you point it and you see what there is. <laughs> so now it sounds like you're doing like a mashup of like things within our galaxy and things outside the galaxy? It's really more like if you have a technique that you know well, then you can start in science applying it to other problems rather than the problem you started with. Most of my PhD thesis, like for the science chapters, were very related to supernovae, so exploding stars and looking for emission from those. And once I had that, it's like, okay, let's apply this to black holes that eat stars. That was kind of the first part of my postdoc. And now we're starting to just go in a completely different angle because why not? I mean, it's pretty cool to start doing a topic that you didn't know much about before you started. You know, thinking about radio transients and, and trying to figure out what their origins are, um, what does this really uh, contribute to the overall understanding in physics? It really depends on the object, obviously, because this is covering like a huge different spectrum of objects. But the main goal here, or the key aspect here, is that different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum give off different emission based off of the different physical processes that create it. So what we're looking for in radio at the frequencies I'm looking at is really synchrotron emission is what it's called. So this is when electrons are spiraling in magnetic fields. So if you have something, for example, like a gigantic space explosion, which honestly most transients are gigantic space explosions, um, which then of course are you know outside of our galaxy, then you basically are studying this emission. And as the shock wave is expanding outward, the magnetic fields will change and you can see like how this shock wave is affecting the environment around it and things like that. So that's really kind of the key goal. There's a lot of emission you can also see even years after one of these explosions happens. So, you know, if you have a supernova, it's very bright in the first, you know, days, Matt, you know, that's the peak. And then it starts to fade. And after a year, you're probably not going to see anything in optical. But radio, I mean, you can see emission for years or even decades after the initial explosion. Um, same with these tidal disruption events. You'll have the same thing where, like, you can't see emission at anything else, but you'll still see radio. So what would you say is, is one of your biggest contributions to the field? or also one of your favorite? Okay, that's kind of interesting because yeah, like, I don't know if, <laughs> I feel like I've been chipping away at things, but there's no, like, I don't have like the one paper yet where I'm like, yeah, I'm the person who did that paper, if that makes any sense. I've really been enjoying like the tidal disruption events lately because it's a relatively new field. The first time there was radio emission detected from one of these was about 10 years ago now. 
And um, so there's really still a lot of open questions about how tidal disruption events happen and unfold. And there's maybe about a hundred of them known still in the uh, universe. So it's not that many of them yet. One of the big questions, for example, in tidal disruption events is it seems like a very small fraction of them, maybe 1% of them have a relativistic jet that gets launched during the tidal disruption event. And 99% of them do not appear to have this. So radio emission is actually the way you can kind of tell what's going on here. Why might this be happening? Think questions like that you can answer that you can't really answer from other frequencies. My next question was going to be like what the hot topic is, but it sounds like it's really these tidal disruption events. Would you agree or to something else? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty hot topic. I think anything exoplanets these days is also just pretty hot. What draws you to your field of astronomy the most? Okay, first of all, I I was one of these people, I wanted to be an astronomer since I was 13 years old, and I read a book about astronomy, and I was like, okay, I'm going to be an astronomer. I decided I wanted to be a radio astronomer when I was a teenager and read and saw Contact uh, by Carl Sagan, and Ellie Arroway was just the coolest person ever. I was like, I want to be Ellie Arroway when I grow up. And then I started doing radio astronomy, and I think it's also just a very powerful uh, wavelength to be working in. I think there's a lot, it's radio astronomy compared to the average astronomy is actually fairly difficult to do, but the reward is very um, high. We are just about one of the same because Contact was, was kind of my book too. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still in the same field of astrophysics? It sounds like that's a yes. So you have always been interested in radio astronomy and, and that's kind of been where you've been since you started research. Yes. I actually, um, so because I didn't, I didn't uh, start doing radio astronomy until my PhD, my undergraduate and my master's degrees are actually in cosmic ray physics was what I was doing uh, with the PROJ observatory. So you're looking for these ultra high energy cosmic rays which have in one atom, basically the amount of energy that a major league pitcher has in a baseball that he throws, but you only see one a square kilometer a century. So you build these giant water tanks out in the plains of Argentina and hope one of these <laughs> will hit your detector. Um, so I was working on that. But yeah, I always wanted to do radio astronomy. So when I started, I was originally in the grad program and then I decided that I was going to leave and do my PhD in radio astronomy specifically. If you could go back and tell yourself one thing as a budding scientist, what would it be? I think it's at the end of the day, when I look at like all the people I've been lucky enough to work with in my career, I don't think it's necessarily the, you know, sort of things we're always like the innate things like, are you smart enough that really matter? It's really the, do you have enough like persistence or grit to kind of see it through? I never had good grades, for example. I don't know why, but I just never tested well. And like, you know, I would get C's pretty regularly on my exams and things like that. But I mean, I still ended up at the CFA for my postdoc and it's like, well, that's kind of strange. I never would have been accepted for undergrad or um, grad school to Harvard. Like I didn't even bother to apply because I knew that wasn't gonna happen. But I just basically kept showing up every day even when I was really dejected that day and working on things. So I feel like that's really actually very important in the long run is, you know, do you have the grit to pull through? I think at the end of the day, like math is hard. I know a lot of people who just think innately like, oh, I'm not good at math. It's like, I'm not good at math either. I didn't get A's in math in college. Like I got, I was a straight B math uh, student, but still I, I could do the math that I need to do every day for work very well. Cause I'm only doing that in math. So right. it's like, okay. Um, yeah. Would you encourage young scientists to pursue this career of an astronomer? And, and if so, why? I mean, I think obviously, yes, I think astronomy is really fun. I actually get approached by many students all around the world uh, asking for advice on how to be astronomers through Reddit. So I actually have a Reddit post, which is just called, so you want to be an astronomer and it is all my thoughts on not being an astronomer. And I think I, you know, it's fairly popular and I've even had students who write to me who are now like in astronomy programs and going to grad school because they like read this post, which is a really cool feeling for me. But yeah, like people are always like, is it worth it? And I'm like, well, like, I don't know you, like for me, it was worth it because, you know, this is something I always wanted to do and I pushed through with it. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but you know, if you think that this is something you want to do and you're willing to put in the work, then, I mean, I can't promise you'll be successful, but if you've never put in the work, you'll probably always wonder if, like, if this is something you really want to do, what would have happened? I think it's very rewarding. If you want to do it, you should at least try. And I mean, also like, 
I don't know anybody who started in astronomy and is like unemployed in a ditch somewhere. You're learning so many problem solving skills when you're going on more like the STEM tracks that it's like, honestly, you'll probably be doing well, better financially uh, than I am on a postdoc salary if you like became a PhD astronomer and decided to leave and go do something else and work for somebody where you can get a lot more money. I mean, you might as well start on it. If you decide you don't want to do it, you can always jump and do something else cool. So, but those are all the questions. So, uh, okay. Thanks, thanks for being here. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thanks.